Good evening, this is Star Thinker, uh, also known as Randy Pischel, Randy R. Pischel. Um, and uh, I've also been known as Valentine Goose, which is the name of this channel. Uh, Valentine Goose came about because that was the name of a trip I took where I went to Valentine, Nebraska, and to the Goose River in Colorado. I also did a lot of other things on that trip, and I wanted to make a video record of it, and so I just created the Valentine Goose channel, and it just kind of stuck. I do have other channels. I've been reviewing movies on a channel, and <clears throat> I have a personal channel that I do videos for just friends and family. So there's a lot of stuff out there, but uh, this is the Valentine Goose channel, and it's where I talk about anything uh, pertaining to my book, or um, I've been talking about Forrest Fenn a lot lately, and I do talk about the paranormal, because I'm, I'm a big fan of paranormal uh, events and videos, and I think it's a lot of fun. Um, but I want to talk about the situation we're all in. Uh, as you can see, I am at work. Uh, I worked nights and I was very, very ill uh, for a week and a half and uh, did not come in. And during that week, they had sent everybody at this location home except for the factory workers. But the office itself, they sent everybody home. We're talking like 120, 140 people. And I was homesick <laughs> during that time. and. Um, you know, I got better. They're like, well, we still want to man the night shift. We still want one person to come in on days because it's not just us. We we support uh, companies. You know, we have factories all over the United States. They're not all shut down. Uh, they do need support. And because of my uniqueness, I'm, I've am i been on the shift for over a year now. And it's funny because I am tech support for our uh, locations in India. So that's kind of a reversal of, of fate there. Um, we outsource stuff to India, and India outsources their tech support to me. So um, they did need someone on the shift, uh, you know, to, mainly to support that and to support the, the factories that run at night. Uh, and, you know, I'd been over everything, so I said, well, sure, I'll just continue coming in. I do work nights. Like I said, this building's completely empty now, uh, so I'm working alone. I, there's no risk of infection. I'm not around other people uh, when I go out to the factory a lot of people don't realize that a factory environment is already has a lot of environmental controls there's already a lot of air scrubbers and you know because it's a factory there's a lot of welding and metal grinding you know we make metal doors uh, so there is a lot of you know people are already wearing respirators people are already you know washing their hands and wearing gloves and stuff so um, yeah, for whatever reason, uh, they decided to keep the factory open. But all the office workers uh, have gone home. All the sales and all, everybody else has gone home. So, yep, I'm here. And <laughs> I know everyone's talking about being home and bored and, oh my gosh, nothing to do. And <laughs> so everybody's working on the poem. And what I've been seeing, because I watch videos, I'm here at night. Uh, you can see I just did a huge shipment. There's four boxes there. I had to pack them up and you know do all the picking and everything so um, one of the things I do when I'm here is I, I'll play YouTube videos and sometimes I pay attention sometimes I don't but um, I just play them because otherwise it's dead silent here and watching so many paranormal videos I don't like dead silence all that much Every, you know if I hear footsteps above me I know I'm alone in the building and I'm like whose footsteps are those <laughs> so yeah I, I just play some uh, I play videos and music just to make sure I don't hear anything. So, um, anyway, what I'm seeing in the videos is a lot of, you know, it's a lot more discussion and, and people are more concentrating on interviews and, and books and everything. And uh, I'm referring to Forrest Fenn here. And uh, I think some of the wilder and crazier theories are starting to come out. And I just wanted to give. But kind of reiterate what I've said before and I got the poem up on my screen up here um, but I believe you know the poem funnels you right to the treasure and um, I, I have no doubt of that I have no doubt that this will lead you to practically step on it and for people who are like well it's going to be in this area I don't think you followed the poem close enough because it's it will take you right there and it's just like I, I said in my hunt, my, my hunt will take you to within inches of the token. I, I'm holding a stone here, I'm kind of playing with it, but that's about how big 
maybe flatter, but that's about how big uh, my token is. And I know the treasure chest. Uh, what do I got that's around here? I don't know. Maybe that size. <laughs> it's my lunch. Um, but, you know, something like that in a bronze box, and, and if it's been out in the, uh, in the wild, it's probably it's going to be corroded unless you put some kind of protection around it. And that's, that's something I was wondering about too. Um, what's looking at pictures of the box. I don't see a way of locking it. Someone could just walk up and open it. I don't know what prevents a, a squirrel from opening it. Um, I've, I buy lots of boxes from, uh, like Hobby Lobby and, None of them are, are fastened very well, but I understand, and I saw this in an interview in one of the videos I watched where, and it was one of the news videos where he was talking to an actual news reporter where he said something like, he said, well, the box alone is $45,000. So, I mean, it's, and I think it was because of the historical significance of the box. So the box itself is no lightweight box. And um, I just can't, I was trying, looking at pictures, trying to figure out how the latch worked, just to figure out how, secure it is you know because i just can't imagine this thing just sitting out there exposed and i'm going to get to that in a minute um but <coughs> excuse me not coronavirus but um uh, just if you look at the poem an, an analogy i made was a football field so when you start at where warm waters halt you're in the same area as the football field is now football field is huge but it's easy for especially for americans to picture how big a football field is and a football field is you know it's 100 yards which is three foot a yard so it's 300 feet long and so when you think about the 200 to 500 foot uh search searchers you know you're talking you know three to 500 feet you know that's the length of a football field and 500 feet of course is you know, a football field and a half, and 200 feet, you know, slightly smaller. But a football field is easy to picture. But, you know, if you think you're within 200 feet and you picture yourself standing on the 50-yard line looking at the end zone, that is a long way to see a little box. And that's a long way, you know, especially if it's hidden, to, to know you're in the right area. But I believe he funnels it down more than that. I don't think any clue will take you, you know, I don't think the poem was only meant to take you within 200 feet. I, I think I think he mentioned this in one of his interviews, and again, all my opinion, none of this, don't take what I say is fact, but it's all my opinion. Um, and I'm remembering, cause like I said, I've watched hundreds of videos, but I, I thought he said, to, like, it'll take you down within a 14-inch area. So... Looking at the clues, you know, if you, if you think of the football field analogy, where warm waters halt is like the region that the football field's in. Take it into Canyon Down. Now you've narrowed it down to the football field. Um, put in behind the home, put in uh, below the home of Brown. Now, like you're standing on the football field, and and again, this is this is how it plays out in my mind. Uh, from there, it's no place from the meek, and the end is drawing ever nigh. You're walking towards the end zone, and something is when you put him below the home of Brown. I think something's going to tell you which way to go. Um, there'll be no paddle up your creek, just heavy loads and water high. I think these are clues, but I think these are not location clues. I don't think you should go where there's heavy loads. I don't think where you should go where there's water high. I think this means like look around. Do you see a heavy load? Do you see water high? And again, this will make sense when you're on the when your boots on the ground. But it's like some of the clues will tell you where to go, but some of the clues will, will have you look around to make sure you're still in the right area. So as long as you're still within that football field, you're on your way um, to the treasure. And then you know if you've been wise and found the blaze, the blaze could be a, you know analogous to the goal poles. The goal poles comes in. You know, most goal poles are shaped like a T and then, you know, it comes to one point on the ground. You walk up to the base of that goal poles and now you're within a 14 inch area. And, uh, you know, that's how I, that's how I see the clues playing out. I don't know which clues are marker clues and which clues are directional clues. Um, but I believe once you get, once you get past where warm waters halt and in the canyon down and put in, be home the, put in below the home of Brown, 
that's when you have to have the poem in front of you while you're walking and then everything will make sense and um, I believe you know from what he said the more I see interviews on him and the more I, I hear people talk that's that's how I believe it plays out um, you know you can find where warm waters halt on a map you can find uh, you know if you got that then you have the canyon and possibly the home of brown but after that the clues won't make sense unless you're standing there. And another analogy of this would be like, there was a, a contest here in Iowa where they hid a key to a, a, a BMW Mini. And um, the key was under, they taped it under a picnic table. Now this was like in the early days of the internet, I think the only mapping program was the Microsoft, you know, they had satellite pictures. But, um, if we use this as, as an example, there was like two clues. One told you what park it was in and one told you where to look. And a picnic table is not permanent at all. And this hunt was only supposed to last 30 days. So for the course of 30 days, a picnic table might be okay. But if you solved the second clue, it's under a picnic table, technically you could go to 20 parks and check the picnic tables at 20 parks and you might find it. But if you find, if you solve the first clue, you know, it's in Mason City Park, uh, you could go to that park and search everything, not knowing it's under picnic, but search under picnic tables, trash cans, the bathrooms, and you might find the key. So one clue or the other might lead you to it, but having both clues together will lead you right to it. And, you know, Forest Poem is more linear. I think it's like, Here's where you start, you know, the big clues are on the map. This is your region. This is your football field. You can see that from the map. Um, I was going to mention, like, from a satellite, you might not see the picnic table. You can find the park. You can find the layout of the park. But a picnic table might be under a tree. It might be, you know, stored for the winter by when the satellite went over. But you might not see the picnic table from a satellite. So I believe from in the home of Brown, I'm on the fence on. I don't know. You know, when he hid this, he might not have known. There might not have been a street view in that area. I know uh, here in Mason City, we didn't have street views except for the main street for years, and it, it drove me crazy. Um, so there might not have been street view. He might not have thought there would ever be street view. So, you know, I'm kind of on the fence on Hall of Brown. You might be able to find it. You might not. Um, but that's, the, that's kind of the tipping point. That's the point from maps and Google Earth to you got to be boots on the ground for everything else to make sense. But people, I've been watching these videos and they're like, oh, there's no such thing as the blaze. And the blaze could be, you know, a big clump of trees. And if you've ever been to a big clump of trees, there's a lot of land you can cover in a big clump of trees. So I believe the, the blaze is going to be that's funny because I've been joking about this because in the poem it says, as I have gone alone in there, and he doesn't necessarily mean himself, he means an I could have gone in there. Um, I can keep my secret where, again, if it's an I, the I can keep the secret. Um, and then like towards the end where he says, uh, the end is ever drawing nigh, drawing an I, drawing I. So I've been joking that the blaze is going to look like an eye, whether a letter I or some, you know, an eyeball I. So that's kind of my joke because I'll go out and I'll look for the letter I or I'll look for an I. And once you find the I, the I is the blaze and look down. That's kind of a joke on my part, but then, you know, when you're going stir crazy and you're, you're home and you got cabin fever and you're like, that makes sense. <laughs> so the more you think about something silly, the more it might make sense. And I'm like, drawing I and as I have gone alone in there and I can keep my secret you know if there's if the blaze is an eye the eye is keeping the secret you know and uh, I've done it tired you know it could be a tired eye and um, I give you title to the gold if you find the eye then you got the gold so I mean a silly idea when you're home letting your mind go crazy is could turn into something that sounds legitimate you know it's like if you repeat a lie over and over and over again, sooner or later you're going to start believing it. And But I wanted to get to the second point where, you know, once you get to this 14-inch area, 
I'm going to relate my own experience. Uh, when I found the token for Mike, Mike Stathers, again, it was about the size of this rock. Um, it was hidden in a tree. And the thing about hiding something in a tree is trees aren't very permanent. And I don't think he intended his hunt to go on for a long time. Uh, it had gone on for like a year, I believe, or maybe two years. But, you know, if you got a tree and you put something in the bottom of a hollow spot in the tree, things are falling. The inside rotting wood and squirrels and leaves and dead weeds and you know so by you know he's and he said in his in the when he wrote the second book about how he did it the snail was actually the first one he hid so it was like his experiment and you know he said he just threw it in the hole and I know for a fact that people and that's a one foot by one foot area which as analogous to the 14 inch by 14 inch area and I know for a fact people have searched that same area that one foot by one foot area they've searched that same exact area and did not find the token I searched that area and did not find the token it was my son who upon leaving said you know he's like why why are we just looking with our eyes he had to dig and he started digging and dig 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 and there it was it was down deeper than you would have thought, you know, because so much stuff had fallen, you know, dust blows in and, and the snow carries stuff in and it was way down there. So at least five, maybe six people had admitted that they'd searched that spot before I got there. That's a one foot by one foot area that people miss something this big. And so we're talking about a chest. I can't remember the size of the chest. This is, I think he said, uh, like 14 by 14 so this is six this is a, a six inch square so you know this is a little bit smaller than what the chest is but something like this and I, I think it wouldn't have been anything that is going to go away soon like when I hit my token I had the spot I was just walking by and I was looking at the spot and I was like you know if someone hit something there what are the odds that someone's going to find it by accident? What are the odds a fire could come through, a flood, a snowstorm? And I kept running through scenarios. And every scenario I ran through in my head, I was like, that would remain. And I think he did the same. Like, when he put the chest down, I don't think he put it down thinking, well, if a forest fire comes through here, bye-bye chest. So it's not in a tree. It's not in a bush. And I don't think it's up in a place where... A flood is going to come through. It might be high enough up where he's not even considering a flood. Um, it, it's probably in a spot where he's not considering there's going to be a landslide or an avalanche, anything that could change the layout of the land. So this spot has to be like a safe spot. And you know, so I'm picturing between two boulders or in a crevice or a crack in the ground. That by the same token, this thing has been out there 15 was it 10 15 years now over a decade at least but in that time I'm positive it's covered with leaves and pine needles and old old weeds and dust and squirrel droppings um, I believe at this point you cannot look with your eyes if you're just walking around looking I, I sincerely think you could practically stand on top of it and not find it um, it's something at this point if you know your spot if you if you found the eyeball that's the blaze <laughs> I keep joking about oh yeah the blaze is an eyeball now but if you find the blaze and you look down and you don't see it get on your knees and do some brushing and it might be deeper than you think um, a crevice I was watching a, a show where that's kind of interesting because I pan for gold myself but this guy you know there was two rocks that that came together and he's like this is where water would have ran this is where gold nuggets would catch and and he was going to clean out this crevice and he kept digging and it kept going deeper and you know first he cleaned out the leaves and the twigs and and the stuff and then he cleaned out like mud and dirt and rotted leaves because you know the leaves start to get rotted they turn into you know compost and soil and he kept going and, going, and i was amazed at how far down how much stuff he had to clear out of there and if this box is sitting in a crevice or between two boulders you know I believe at this point um, it's not going to be something you can just look down and see 
Uh, there's a chance maybe maybe he's gone out and cleaned it off from time to time, which I doubt. Um, I feel like at this point people are watching him. He's probably got six different GPS devices on his car, and you know. So I think uh, I don't think he would have gone out. I don't think he would have told anyone to go out and do it. But I do think at this point it's covered with debris, and it's probably not visible to the naked eye. Um, I do have a metal detector. Um, I've been practicing with it. Um, one thing I didn't do was test it on bronze. I do have a bronze pig, and my bronze pig is actually about this big, and it's made out of bronze. It's a piggy bank, but it's made out of bronze. I might take that out in the yard and, and throw it in the yard and, and just see what tones my metal detector picks up on that and how far I can pick it up, maybe cover it. You know, we bought this house in the wintertime, so we never saw a lawn, but now we could tell that no one raked the yard last year. You know, cover it up with leaves, cover it up with twigs, see how the metal detector picks it up. Also, I'm worried about, like, if it's between two boulders, you know, that go up and down, and my metal detector doesn't fit in there, you know, I will have to reach. You know, maybe it's an arm length in, you got to dig. Um, and maybe that's why he had to take two trips. If he had to take the box and stick it in a crack at arm's length, that might have been too heavy. You know, and he might have stuck it in there and opened the lid up and then filled it up. You know, there's these these are the things that cross my mind are the actual mechanics of what you would have to do to hide a box like this. And yeah, at this point, and I have, like I said, I have a solve. I'm very, the more I think about it, and again, I don't even think it's biased at this point. It's, it's thinking of something over and over and over again to the point where you absolutely positively believe it. And so I was looking... Um, I think my warm water's hot is spot on. I think my canyon down is spot on. Um, from there, I'm going to have to go boots on the ground and then check it out. Um, there's other people, uh, this fire hole canyon, this fire hole. But I don't see, I don't know, it didn't fit as well as where I wanted to go. But I'm going past that area, I might, and like right now you can't because um, everything's shut down. But when time is open again, you know, I might spend a day in that area just checking it out. Uh, but I'm going to go to my area first and spend a day or two there. Um, my Honda is set up as a camper. I had very good luck camping in it when I went on my other trip. But, yeah, I, I'm not having any issues driving to the spot. I'll put my big backpack on. Uh, if I do happen to find it, you know, my backpack... When I went hiking in the Rockies, my backpack weighed, I weighed it once, and it was 60 pounds um, with only about half the water I carry. So <laughs> a 40-pound backpack isn't going to feel like much. I've been, with this time we have, I've been prepping myself. Um, I told my grandkids, because I live with my grandkids, um, you know, make me get out and walk once a day. And we walked today, and we only walked like half a mile. And it wasn't because that's all I could walk. It was just time constraint but yeah I'm like I'm gonna have to walk at least a mile you know I, I think that's the least you're gonna have to walk I you know I don't think Forrest would have walked more than a mile so that's what I'm gonna practice you know I did live a few years in the Rockies I think I was in the best health I ever was when I lived there um, I got to the point where and, you know, in, in the Rockies, you don't just measure, hey, I walked seven miles today, but you measure, hey, I walked 900 feet vertical. So I walked seven miles up 900 feet and then seven miles down 900 feet. And, you know, that takes its toll as well. Uh, I don't know if I could do that today. I'm, I'm not in the shape I was. But I think as long as I can walk, if I can walk two miles, I think I'm safe. Um, but, yeah, little things like that, practicing with my metal detector, um, I keep watching the interviews. I keep watching the live shows. I keep watching what other people are thinking because I'm still using my jelly bean effect. And every time someone mentions a solve, I'll put a pin in it somewhere and um, think, okay, you know, there's 50 pins in this area and only one pin over here. You know, on average, who's going to be right? And maybe it's probably the 50 pins over here. So, yeah, when this is all lifted, I can just picture me going to my spot. And there's like 15 other people, you know, like the end of it's a mad, 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 mad world. Where, oh, had to take a service call. 
Um, but I was talking about it's man, 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 man world where everyone's rushing around at the end uh, because they've all, they all have, and that's a good analogy too. They all had to solve. They all knew it was in a park or they all knew it was under a giant W. Um, but until your boots on the ground, you don't know what any of that means. Um, so that's not pictures. I'm going to get to my spot, you know, as soon as all this is lifted and there's going to be people running around with metal detectors and, and stuff and all, all not saying something to each other because they don't want people to know it's their searchers and, you know, they'll be eyeballing each other. One guy will be carrying a shovel and a pick and, you know, it's going to be, uh, anyway, that's how I'm picturing it. But again, I might get there and because I'll take time off, I'll be there during the week, hopefully, and, and there won't be that many people around. But, uh, yeah, it will be interesting. I do know that there is a cam in my search area. I found a, a gas station with a camera on it. And I was hopeful for a while because this camera, like right in the middle of winter, January time frame, there was no snow on the ground. And I was like, ooh, you know, way up and wait. Oh, I almost gave it away. <laughs> but in this area, like no snow on the ground is really unusual. So, um, I've been watching the weather report. Some big blizzards blew through there, and I like pulled up this camera again. I mean, there was cars buried in the parking lot. I'm like, oh crap! So, yeah, there is snow there now. So I wouldn't go searching in deep snow. But again, snow brings debris, and that's gonna fall on top of the chest. I, I just think right now the chest is not visible to the naked eye. So anyway, I'm gonna take off. I'm gonna have to meld this last minute onto my other video. Um, but I got a scanner issue I got to go solve. So take it easy. Uh, hopefully this wasn't such an incoherent rant as some of my other ones. But uh, yeah, that's one thing to keep in mind. The poem will funnel you to it. I don't think it'll funnel you to the area. I don't think it'll funnel you to a general area. I think it's going to funnel you right to standing on the treasure. And when you're there, you might not see it because it's probably going to be buried. But those are the points I was going to make today. So anyway, I'm going to wrap it up. Take care. Randy Pischel, books on Amazon, and all that good stuff. Thanks.